Good evening. Hello, folks. Come on, folks. This is Harvard. Really, bring it down. God. Jeez. My name is Josh Silver. I have the uh, I have the distinguished honor of introducing tonight's keynote speaker. And um, just so you know who I am, I, I drove a Chevy Nova out to Arizona back in 1997 and managed the 1998 Arizona Clean Elections Act, uh, knowing back then what I know now, which is that this issue that you folks have gathered here for today, this issue of special interest dominance and governance and government is no doubt the most important issue facing our country. And I feel almost like gifted to be able to actually use such hyperbole and have it be true, which you can't really say that about most issues. Uh, it is the fulcrum of every issue that you care about, and you know that, and that's why you're here. I run something called the Democracy Fund. It's a new organization that was started just uh, last year, but really in earnest this year. And it, it's been created to figure out strategies that can actually win these fights to uh, bring the American people back to the table in Washington and in state capitals and to bring a whole lot more money to that effort. Because as folks know, it's a vastly under-resourced field. We, we estimate that somewhere around $20 million a year, maybe 25, is spent on the entirety of the public interest efforts to beat back the undue influence of money in politics. I was running Free Press, the nation's leading uh, media and technology organization. Thank you. I started it in 2003, ran it for the last 10 years. And what was so amazing about running Free Press, uh, or one of the most amazing things, was, was watching what most people don't realize, and that is how massive the infrastructure of influence actually is. That it goes so far beyond campaign contributions and lobbyists, which is what you read about all the time and what's readily available on websites, but it, how it's these astroturf groups, these fake grassroots groups that many of you know about, PR firms, independent expenditures, advertisements, these politicians and their staff that just cycle right out of government and right into the special interest sector and spend, just get paid huge amounts of money and, and, and exert huge influence. These guys, I, I call them these, these press flacks. They like have these fake front groups. They're alone in a, literally alone in like a, in the basement of their house getting hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just to attack public interest groups and call them any manner of sort of, uh, of horrific names and discredit, you know, sort of shoot the messenger since the merits of their patrons' policy proposals can't be defended. And so I've got to this point where um, we have this very profound existential question of what are we going to do? How, how are we going to actually win? And I think it's appropriate that I'm asking this question here because it occurred to me as I was up in the room waiting to come down here and I'm looking at this room, I realized this is the room that when the Federal Communications Commission had a hearing a few years ago, I think it was about the Comcast NBC merger. And it turns out that there were all these guys sleeping right here. You guys are awake, thank you. And, and they were just sleeping, and it was bizarre. We photographed that. It turned out we busted these guys, having been paid by Comcast, to fill up about a quarter of this room so that the literally hundred or so really interested citizens downstairs that were locked out of this room because it was at capacity could not get in because they wanted to keep it quiet and, and keep it... That's the kind of... Now, who, do you think Comcast paid them to get in here? No, no, no. Comcast paid a firm, some kind of public relations firm, that then paid some other maybe C3 or C4 organ, public interest organizations, or I should say nonprofit. They could have paid another one. It works in these, it's like a consultant, and then eventually it gets to that. And that just kind of demonstrates, so it's appropriate that we're in this, this room today. Um, I'm gonna be quick, I only was given five or 10 minutes, I'm almost at the end, so I, what I will say is this. Whatever comes of this conference, Whatever are, turn out to be the best solutions, the most effective and promising solutions to fix this, this crisis. Today, at this moment, there is not nearly the sufficient political heat, the scandal, the leverage, the uproar, the outrage in this country. It's simmering, it's latent, you hear it when you talk to people, but it's not front of mind enough. And our job, all of us in this room, 
and our, the organization I work for, our job is to bring it to a boil, to have it boil over, to create the kind of rage that was, that was key, that was present at the, at the start, at the catalyst of every major moment in our nation's history when there was great change. If you think about it, every time there was a major profound change in policy to protect the public interest, it came at a moment of scandal and a moment of populism. And that's what we have to recreate uh, now. And fortunately, history is on our side. It's been done before. And so we don't have to think of this as impossible, but it is really hard because of the obvious baked in obstacles on this issue. It means brass knuckle investigations that expose the quid quo pro corruption that defines Washington and our state capitals. It means a much more robust communications infrastructure, war rooms that look like presidential campaign rooms just on this issue, with not just a couple, but dozens of communications professionals pushing this issue into every story. It means online and on the ground organizing. It re re means creating actual political pain for politicians, actually getting some of those guys, the dirtiest ones, out of office on this issue. That's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take a focus on that. But at the same time we do that, and we're looking at these policy solutions like a constitutional convention, I am submitting to you the two following things that, I want, uh, that I'll close with and I want you to take away from tonight. Number one, that we should not relegate ourselves to just one policy solution. I believe, and I'm, I'm biased, I actually used to work on public funding of elections, I don't do it now, but I think that many different policies need to be advanced as part of a large unified block with all of the different parties who are caring about this, these issues behind that block of issues because the real nature of policy making is that it's quirky, it's quixotic, and leaders grab on to certain changes at certain times based on the political moment. And we have to create a menu so that when we get the train of corruption moving fast enough and they are forced to break the glass and pull that lever, that that lever takes the form of a broad range of policies that reduce the undue influence of money in politics, that increase voter participation, that improve the functionality and integrity of elections and the legislative process, that reduce special interest influence over the judiciary, and that increase corporate accountability and transparency. I'm gonna quiz you on that. <laughs> but the second thing that I'm gonna leave you with is the truism that tonight's keynote speaker has known since he bravely joined this fray uh, a couple of years ago, I believe. Time flies. And that is that there's no way that this is gonna happen unless people on the left and people on the right agree to put down their disagreements and leave them aside and focus on what we agree on, which is that government is broken, that it can be better, that special interests are running the show and they can't and shouldn't if our democracy is to survive. Larry Lessig has known this from, since the day he got into this, this movement. He has been its most articulate speaker and one of its most effective leaders, and I'm honored to introduce to you Larry Lessig. So it's extraordinarily cool to see so many friends here tonight who have been in this movement for such a long time arguing about these issues, people I've spoken to before and people I have the chance to speak to for the first time tonight. But I want you to understand my relationship to this question of a constitutional convention. I'm not in this fight for a constitutional convention for academic reasons. I'm not like Bill Walker, who just thinks this is a good thing that ought to happen because it has been called for by states. I'm in this because I increasingly believe this issue, this decision to push for a constitutional convention is essential to solving a critical problem our democracy faces. And it's that problem of democracy that motivates me. And it's a problem of democracy that will be shared, I think, when properly understood, agreed to by both people on the left and the right. So I'm supposed to be the left keynote. I will fail in that tonight. Because if I say anything that anybody on the right disagrees with, I have not done my job. 
I want to explain this in a way that makes compelling the need for this convention to people on the left and the right who want to save this republic. So, I've told this story before, this image, this image, a thousand hacking at the branches of evil. Thoreau, 1846 in Walden Pond. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Imagine a letter from a young woman. There were two clocks regulating our life. The one on the wall, the one in the bottle. And we built our life around those two clocks. He would sleep late, so mornings were bliss. We could play and laugh without fear. But at some point, he would awake. And soon after he woke, the bottle was opened. And then the older the day grew, the more terrifying life became. He was happy at first, just before dinner, the most happy. That's the only time I would speak to him, a moment when I could pretend I had a father who had a feeling of love. He'd smile, he would laugh, but soon he'd grow irritated, and by the end of dinner he was angry, and if we were not gone, usually just hiding in our room by nine, he would be violent. He hit me more than once. Once he tried to do something more than just hitting me, and then I left, and I never went back. We struggled to do many things in that house, to keep food in the house, to keep the winter out of the house, to keep the house. But we never even spoke about getting him to stop. I don't know why. The bottle was part of our life. We learned to live with it. Anything more just seemed impossible. Now, the thing about us, we humans, is that we just come to adapt. We adjust. We learn to live our life with whatever the constraint, the problem is that is facing us until we can't. And when we can't, what we need is this Thoreauvian moment, this Thoreauvian recognition. The recognition that though there are a thousand branches of evil that we can spend our life hacking at. We have to find the root. We have to become root strikers. So there is this feeling among too many Americans today that we just might not make it. Not that the end is near or that doom is around the corner, but that a distinctly American feeling of inevitability of greatness, culturally, economically, politically, is just gone, that we have become Britain, or Rome, or Greece. A generation ago, Ronald Reagan rallied the nation to deny a similar charge by Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter's worry that our nation had fallen into a state of malaise. I was one of those people so rallied, and I still believe Reagan was right. Because the feeling I'm talking about today is different. It's not that we, as a people, have lost anything of our potential, but that we, as a republic, have. That our capacity for governing, the product in part of a constitution that we have revered for more than two centuries, has come to an end. That the thing we were most proud of, this, our republic, is the one thing that we all have learned to ignore. Government is an embarrassment. It has lost the capacity to make the most essential decisions, and slowly it dawns upon us that a ship that can't be steered is a ship that will sink. This is not a democratic or a republican point. This is a multi-partisan frustration. This view that this government doesn't work is a view shared by people across the political spectrum. Indeed, the only institution in our republic that has a majority of Americans with confidence in that institution is the one non-democratic institution in our republic. There are many issues that signal to us the failure of this government, many issues on the left and the right that are systematically blocked by this system. And I want you to look for the root in this 
blockage, the Thorovian cause. Now, to get you to see that, I need to brainwash you a bit, so that's what I intend to do here. Um, some examples that will bring you around to this Thorovian recognition. You've seen, many of you have seen some of these examples before. Let's go through them. So, for many years, indeed, beginning in this room, I became an activist around copyright. October 27, 1998, when Congress passed and the president signed a statute honoring this great American, Sonny Bono, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, I became an activist. This is a statute that extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. And the question Congress was to ask when they passed that statute was, did it advance the public good? Now, copyright, of course, is a monopoly we give to authors to give them the incentives to produce great work. It's an essential part of the creative process. But the thing about incentives is that at least in this universe, not Star Trek's universe, but this universe, incentives are prospective. No matter what the United States Congress does, George Gershwin will not produce anything more. So when we challenged this statute in the Supreme Court, we got a bunch of economists, including this left winger, oh, I'm sorry, wait, this is Milton Friedman, right wing, <laughs> Nobel Prize winner of economics, who agreed to sign the brief challenging this extension only if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. <laughs> so obvious was it that you could not extend the public good by expanding the term in an existing copyright, but apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously extended the term of this existing copyright. What there was was more than $6 million from Disney and its affiliates supporting this extension of existing terms that would benefit it primarily and many other of these famous copyright holders. Here's another example. This is a picture of a 15-year-old boy. It's a picture of an epidemic, an obesity epidemic sweeping our nation. Three times the number of children today are obese as in 1980. Of children over the age of two, more than one-third are technically obese. This epidemic has costs. How striking is the rise of type 2 diabetes, a kind of diabetes that typically afflicted old people only. Now, in some communities, one half of all new cases are cases with kids. It costs our society, according to the Center for American Progress, $147 billion annually to deal with this problem. Why do we have it? Well, in part, it has to do with what we eat. There's a consensus among people who know something about the matter. We eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff, and not technically sugar. What we eat too much of is something that we didn't consume at all in 1980, but now is in 40% of the products in your supermarket, high fructose corn syrup. So why is that? What explains this explosion of this sugar substitute? Well, in part, it's because sugar is so expensive, corn is so cheap. And the lovers of the free market say, well, them's just the breaks. If that's what the market demands, then this is the way we have to order our economy because the market is signaling where efficient allocation of resources should go. But it's not quite so simple, this story. Sugar is so expensive in America because tariffs protect the domestic sugar industry, giving them about a billion dollars in extra profits, costing the economy about three billion dollars in inefficiency because sugar costs between two and three times the price of other comparable developed nations. And Corn is so cheap in the United States because it's subsidized by the government. $74 billion in the last 15 years, leading some economists to calculate the cost of producing corn is actually negative. Now add sugar to corn and you begin to understand the radical shift in the cost of food. So over the last period, 1997 to 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. The cost of a Big Mac went down by 5.4%. The cost of a bottle of Coke went down by 35%. And you begin to see a radical reason for a radical shift in how food gets made. I'm sure many here saw this extraordinary film, Food, Inc., which tells a story about how, because corn is so cheap, it's profitable to feed cattle corn rather than have them graze on grass. Not so profitable for the cows because, of course, cows' stomachs don't digest corn. It just stews in their seven stomachs. And as it stews, it begins to breed an extraordinary range of bacteria calling for antibiotics that have to be fed literally in the tons 
to these cows, which of course breed out a plentiful supply of antibiotic resistant bugs. And if this were a film, we'd cut to a story about a four-year-old boy who ate a hamburger and died because of the poisons that came through that food. All of this because corn is so cheap and sugar is so dear. So what explains such anti-free market silliness? And the answer is lots of things. We have presidential primaries that begin in Iowa, whatever you want to say. But the one thing that we know for sure is the endless campaign cash given by those who benefit from this policy. So ADM spends millions to support the corn policy. And uh, the, the domestic manufacturers of sugar spend millions as well to protect their tariffs, all of this money driven to this crazy mix of policies. And if because of campaign dollars this is our policies, we can say campaign money distorts the market, which distorts food production, which distorts our children. Or finally, think about the Wall Street debacle, the collapse to our economy that was triggered by a collapse in Wall Street in 2008. Why do we have that collapse? Well, according to the story, Simon Johnson and James Quack tell in this book, 13 Bankers, in part, it's the product of a perverse mix, both too little government and too much government. So too little government in the form of deregulation of these extraordinary financial innovations that were launched in the 1990s, derivatives, innovations that were invisible to the market because the rules did not require that trades of these financial assets be reported in the way that all other financial asset trades had to be reported. So my friend Frank Partnoy estimates that in 1980, 98% of the assets traded in our economy were traded on publicly traded markets, transparent pricing, subject to anti-fraud requirements as the standard New Deal regulations required. But because of this, decision to deregulate derivatives, by 2008, 90% of the assets traded in our economy were traded in this shadow banking economy, not subject to public transparency requirements, not subject to pricing information being in the market itself, not subject to anti-fraud requirements, which of course encouraged the bubble that eventually burst and took this economy down. But that alone wasn't enough. In addition to too little government, there was too much government. Because through the 1990s, there was a clear signal by the federal government that there was a government guarantee here that when this bubble burst, there would be a bailout at the other side, producing the dumbest socialism ever invented by man, socialized risk, and privatized benefit. They get the upside, we bear the downside. Now, this is a technical legal term. I don't mean to be too legal in my analysis, but here, let me just tell you the term. This is insanely stupid policy. <laughs> insanely stupid. What explains this stupidity? Well, there's lots of possible accounts, but the one thing we know here is the fastest growing and largest part of the contributions to members of Congress in our system over the last 20 years has come from the financial sector and the securities sector in our market, the money driving this policy. Now, no respectable liberal, libertarian, or conservative could defend these cases. Each of them is an abomination from each of those philosophies. So why is it? we had these abominable uh, policies. Though the political scientists will say they're uncertain, I am certain you believe you know. I am certain you believe you know why, simply because in each case I pointed you to the money. And after I pointed you to the money, you began to have a sense of a root cause. And my claim is this, number one, it's because of cases like this that Americans believe money buys results in Congress. Indeed, in a poll we conducted in January, 75% of Americans said, quote, money buys results in Congress. A Little bit more of the Democrats than the Republicans, but I can guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House, the numbers were the same, just the parties were reversed. Whether it's two thirds or three fourths, we all believe money buys results in Congress. Number two, that belief erodes trust in this institution of Congress. 
Gallup's latest poll, I'm sorry, I'm exaggerating. This was last year's poll. Last year's poll was Congress had an 11% confidence rating. This year, 12% confidence rating. 12% of Americans believe have confidence in this institution. Now, how low do you have to go until the institution is politically bankrupt? How low? As was commented earlier by Sandy, at the time of the revolution, it's certainly the case that more people believed in the British crown than believe in our Congress today. Which leads to number three. This low trust erodes participation in the system. Rock the Vote, which of course is extraordinarily successful in registering and turning out to vote young people, polled their members about why they weren't going to turn out in 2010. And the number one answer by far that they gave was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And that's not a view of just kids. Vast majority did not vote in part because of this belief. And number four, this low participation leaves the fox guarding the hen house, or even worse, it leaves this institution governing our nation. Now, it is easy to convince people on the left of this story. There's some skepticism of people on the right. But the single most important thing for you to see tonight is how this point about money, this point about money being a root cause here, is not just a point for the left, it's also a point for the right. So to the right, I want to say this. Ronald Reagan gave us the birth of an extraordinary movement. I think I might be, tell me if this is true, the only member of a delegation in the 1980 Republican convention that nominated and eventually got Ronald Reagan elected. Was there any, were you there, Ralph? No. Okay, so I am the only true 1980 Reaganite in this room. I was. You're a member of the delegation? Okay, member of a delegation, that's my point. Ronald Reagan had a certain important fear which he expressed again and again. The fear was government spinning out of control. And the cause of that spinning was both internal and external. Internal, it was the bureaucrats who were going to cause government to spin out of control. External, it was a statement, a quote that Reagan repeated again and again from someone he called Alexander Titler. It's not clear that Titler existed, but here it is. Titler's <laughs> quote, quote, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the benefit, most benefits from the treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy. So the argument is bureaucrats and mobs will lead to government growth and bankruptcy. And I think most people kind of believe that he was right as incorrect about government growth. We've seen an extraordinary explosion of government growth. And it's hard not to believe that we're not bankrupt at this moment because of the size of the deficits and the size of that growth. So growth and bankruptcy we concede to Reagan. But the question is, was it the bureaucrats and the mobs? Are they really the cause of this problem? So I could tell a million stories here, to consider just two. The Communications Act, 1934, was divided between six titles. Title II regulated telecom, like telephones, and DSL. Title VI regulates cable. When Al Gore was vice president, he had an idea, after he invented the internet, such a cheap shot, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> he had the idea to take the internet-related parts of Title II and Title VI and put them into a new title, Title VII, and this Title VII would be fundamentally deregulated. Minimal regulations far below even the net neutrality regulations people are speaking of now. Took, his staff took the idea to the Hill. Senior staffer told me the response he got from the Hill. The response was, hell no. How are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them? We choose to regulate in part about determined by the ease with which we can raise money. Or here's another example. The Wall Street Journal had a story in the last, at the end of last year about these temporary tax provisions. 
tax provisions that are designed to expire after a short period of time and requiring an extension when they're about to expire. And as the journal described it, there's a kind of extension mania that's taken over in our tax code, and they couldn't figure out why. And in fact, extension, these kind of temporary tax provisions begin with Ronald Reagan. In 1981, Ronald Reagan's uh, administration proposed the Research and Development Tax Credit. The Democrats were skeptical. So in the deal they struck, the tax credit was made temporary so as to test it. And the deal was, Economists would look at the results and say whether this tax credit made sense. Did it work? And the answer is, it did work. All of the economists polled, on the left and the right, agreed this was a great tax credit idea because it spurred a kind of investment that otherwise wouldn't have been uh, made. So it made sense, absolutely, for this to be part of our tax code. But here's the puzzle. It's still temporary. So why is it still temporary? Rebecca Kaisar, in this piece in the Georgia Law Review, describes the reason. She says, the principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. These businesses, business entities, are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure the continuation of this large tax savings. Or as the Institute for Policy Innovation describes in their Tax Bites newsletter, the cycle has repeated itself for years. Congress allows the credit to lapse until another short extension is given, preceded, of course, by a series of fundraisers and speeches about the importance of nurturing innovation. Congress essentially uses this cycle to raise money for re-election, promising the industry more predictability the next time around. Now, this dynamic is central to how DC works. And there's something astonishing to recognize that in part we architect our tax policy to make it easier to raise campaign money. Just like, you can say, we architect the regulatory policy, as Al Gore discovered, to make it easier to raise money. So why wouldn't we eliminate these tax extenders? Well, you can imagine an equivalent response, hell no. How are we gonna raise money from these targets if we eliminate their special benefits given to them by this exception in the tax code? Now, in both cases, the point is the same. There is a political economy to how government works. And the question that increasingly gets asked in this Congress is how does our deployment of our regulatory power help us raise campaign funds? Which means we're certain to have more regulations, more complicated taxes, more senseless monopolies. No surprise then that even though we've had 20 years of Reagan-like presidencies in the last 30, we still have no smaller government and no simpler taxes. And we won't be seeing these until we eliminate the obvious conflict that exists between those who say they want simpler taxes or smaller government and their constant need to raise funds to get back into Congress until we strike at this route. Now, it wasn't supposed to be like this, right? The framers of our Constitution gave us what they called a republic. But as the Federalists make clear, a republic, by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And as Federalist 52 describes this representative democracy, it would have a branch that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's the model of American government. It's pretty cool, right, the way that bounces? I do my own graphs here. So it's kind of... <laughs> the people, in a marionette-like way, holding the Congress, the Congress dependent upon the people. Here's the problem. Congress has evolved a different dependence not just upon the people, but increasingly upon the funders, the funders of campaigns. So between 30 and 70% of the time that a congressperson spends as a congressperson is spent raising money to get back to Congress or getting his or her party back into power. And as you spend 30 to 70% of your time raising money, you develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what you do might affect your ability to raise the money you need to raise to get back to Congress or to pay your dues to your party to get your party back into Congress. And they become, in the X-file sense of the term, shapeshifters. They begin to alter who they are 
to make sure they are able to raise this money. So Leslie Byrne describes that when she went to Congress, Democrat from Virginia, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And then she clarified, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> now this is a dependency too. It's a different and conflicting dependency from a dependency upon the people alone because, here's the obvious point, the funders are not the people. This is not quid pro quo corruption. This is a distracting and distorting dependency corruption. Now, in an academic environment with political scientists around, we need to be a little bit careful. There's some questions you might want to raise about this. For example, maybe the funders are the people. Maybe it turns out that they just overlap such that if you follow the funders, you are following the people. Well, the answer is no, the funders are not the people. The rich are the funders. The middle class and poor are not the funders. So they're not following the people overall, they're following a subset of the people. So then people say, well, maybe they ignore the funders and follow the people. Again, the answer here is no. Clayton Peoples from University of Nevada done an extraordinary um, uh, empirical study which unlike most of the empirical studies that try to look at the relationship between money and results, actually collected this relationship for 7,000 bills between 1991 and 2006 and concludes statistically significant contrib contributor influence in seven of the eight houses, in seven of the two-year house cycles. The one year where there wasn't an ability to show this influence was the one year the House was considering the McCain-Feingold Campaign Finance Reform Act or as Martin Guylands describes in a study that originally collects 1,781 public, interest sur public surveys of attitudes about public issues, and then tracks how actual government decisions reflect the attitudes of people expressed in those surveys. And he looked at a subset of these surveys, 887, where the top 10% I'm using this as a proxy for the funders, the top 10% had one view and the bottom 90% had a different view. So what did Congress do when 10% wanted to go this way and 90% wanted to go that way? And the answer Guylands concludes is that I find that when Americans with different income levels different in their, differ in their policy preferences, actual policy outcomes strongly reflect the preferences of the most affluent, but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of the poor or middle income Americans. There is a vast discrepancy between what Congress would be doing if it were following its dependence upon the people and what it in fact does. I think we can say we know this. Number one, Congress is dependent upon the funders in the sense the framers meant dependency. Number two, they follow policy preferences of the funders. And number three, that means the intended dependence of the framers have been lost. Now, this is corruption. It's not brown paper bag corruption. It's not Rob Lagojevich corruption. I'm not talking about any criminal law being violated. I'm not talking about cash secreted among members of Congress. It is a corruption of the intended dependence that the framers had. It is dependence corruption, the wrong dependency. In that sense, a corruption, a corruption of the independence Congress was intended to have. Independence. And so we need here not a declaration of independence, but a declaration for independence, a declaration for the idea that this institution needs to be independent, not just of the president, which is of course also a concern of the framers, but also independent of influences that undermine their ability to do their job, which is to follow the will of the people. Now, there's not gonna be any change in this Obama sense until we change this, until we fix this dependency, until we in some sense make the funders overlap with the people by making it so that they don't focus on the dependency on funders, but increasingly more on the people. We have to find a, get, find a way to give them away. I don't, that's two words. I don't mean like give Congress away. That'd be fun too. But like give them a way to fund without Faust, right? Without selling their souls and without alienating America. And the sad but hopeful bit of this story is that there is one but only one candidate in the whole of the presidential mix who's even talking about this issue, Buddy Romer, Republican candidate for president. I call him $100 Buddy because 
he is taking no more than $100 from anybody, no PAC money, disclosing everything, and he's running a campaign whose slogan is free to lead. He wants to be free to lead by not being dependent upon this kind of funding. Now, in this room, Buddy Romer gave a speech last spring, which he outlined four principles that he said needed to guide any system that would address this corrupting influence. First principle is, no system of funding campaign should try to silence anyone or any view. So he does not believe that Citizens United was wrong in the sense that it allowed a corporation to speak. His view is corporations, like anybody, should be allowed to speak whether they dominate the political process is a second question. Number two, no system of funding campaign should force any citizen to support political speech that he or she doesn't believe in. Should use my money to support my speech or my tax money to support my speech, but not my tax money to support your speech. Number three, no bureaucrat in Washington should be in the business of deciding how much any campaign for Congress deserves to get. Number four, any system must permit, indeed encourage individuals to give at least a small amount of their own money to support the campaigns that they believe in. Now I took Buddy's principles and I boiled them together to build in this book that um, just, is just coming out right now, Republic Lost a conception of what we could call small dollar funded elections, which is inspired in part by the experience of the red state Arizona, the red blue state Maine, and the blue state Connecticut, not quite, but inspired by them to permit candidates to fund their elections with small dollar contributions only. And the thing to recognize is if we had the vast majority of candidates funding their campaigns with small dollar contributions only, like in Connecticut, 88% of candidates funded their campaign through this small dollar system. If that's the way they funded their campaigns, then the thing we could say is that we could once again believe as we all want to believe that whatever stupid reason Congress had for doing what Congress did, whether it's because there are too many Republicans or too many Democrats, the one thing we could not believe was it was because of the money because we would have removed this one corrupting dependency that leads us to be so pathologically cynical about everything this government does. So how do we get to that place? It is not hard to see the problem. It is not hard to describe a solution to that problem. What is hard, what is impossibly hard, is to imagine the political strategy that would bring that solution about and the reason that's so hard is an insight provided by another person who spoke in this room last spring, Jim Cooper, Democrat from Tennessee, who has been in Congress as long as all but 20 other members of Congress. And Jim Cooper said, the single thing you need to understand about how Congress has evolved is that Congress is now a, quote, farm league for K Street. Members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model in their head, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So Public Citizen calculated between 1998 and 2004, 50% of senators left to become lobbyists, 42% of members of the House. Those numbers are only higher today. Everyone depends in Washington on this system surviving. So in a world where everyone depends upon the system surviving, how is it we're going to bring about a change in this system? What is the strategy for taking life inside this beltway and turning it upside down? Well, in the book, I outline four ideas. One of them is a normal idea. It's also impossible. The idea of getting a statute passed by Congress that tries to establish this small dollar funded election system. I fight for that statute. I fought for it when Congress came close to passing it, but I think there's no chance they passed that statute because of this insight that they depend upon the system to survive, not just for their current life, but for their future life. So in addition to that one sane but impossible idea, I describe a series of insane ideas, but just improbable, each of them. And some of them are so insane, I'm not even going to tell you about them because I'm kind of embarrassed by just how insane they are. But the thing about all of them is that they are all ways around the cancer that is this beltway. The cancer on the way this government functions. The one strategy that we have been talking about today is the strategy of the Constitutional Convention. Article 5's 
provision of the option for citizens to get their legislatures to call for a convention. Now, as I've listened to the debate today, it seems to me there's some bit of perspective that's necessary before we dive into understanding exactly what's at stake in this fight. We need to recognize first, there is a constitutional convention in existence right now. Here it is. This institution, Congress, right now, has the power to propose whatever amendments it wants. It has the power to propose them and send them out to the states. And that's all a convention does, propose amendments to the states. But this is a convention of insiders. The insiders have a monopoly over the amendments that get proposed. And why does that make sense? Why is a convention worse than what this institution would do? Why is it more frightening than what that institution could do? And why is there not trust at least as much for what we the people in a process of facilitating a convention could do as that institution would do? Indeed, if that institution has a 12% confidence level, what do you have to say about us if you say that you trust them more than us? Right? Now, the argument for a convention here, yeah, thank you. The argument for a convention here, I think, has a number of parts. Number one, as many people through the day have tried to insist, what we're talking about here is an Article V convention, not a constitutional convention. We're talking about a convention within the terms of Article V, terms that have a procedure for proposing, not for amending the Constitution, for proposing amendments to the Constitution proposing. It's just about a platform upon which we can talk about what changes there should be. Number two, could Congress constrain that process? My view is yes, Congress can constrain that process. The Necessary and Proper Clause to the Constitution which said, Congress has the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and other powers vested by this Constitution of the United States. It says, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States, the power to call a convention is included within the scope all, which means Congress has the power to constrain consistent with the propriety of a clause designed to give the states the right to demand consideration of amendments to the Constitution, which means if the states in an appropriate way signal to Congress they want a certain kind of limits, I think it's completely appropriate within the Necessary and Proper Clause for Congress to enact those limits. So what happens if the convention exceeded those limits? And here's where Barbara Perry um, and uh, Professor Weber's work was so important. If the convention exceeded the limits, if the rule was do this, but the convention did that, the most important obvious consequence of that would be to weaken the political legitimacy of that convention. And that weakened political legitimacy would weaken the likelihood that anything that came out of that convention would actually have any effect on the Constitution at all. And the point, the insight of their book was to get people to recognize how the political reality here resolves all sorts of questions which the law professor might raise. So the thing that's so striking about Professor Tribe's skepticism and his unwillingness to acknowledge the importance of this political reality is in the one most painful case that he ever dealt with, Bush v. Gore we can see exactly how this political reality has its effect. Because the law professor tribe, or any of us, had a million questions that we could raise about the procedure that was followed to get to the conclusion that in fact we got to. A million law professor questions. But at a certain point, those questions didn't matter anymore. 
There was a political understanding about legitimacy that drove a conclusion independent of the skepticism of the law professor. And so even if we worry about whether there's enough precedent for each of the tiny dots or T's that need to be crossed here, the reality is a system that said, here's the rules, and a convention that broke the rules would be a system that would say that convention is illegitimate and we're not gonna to listen to what it says. That's the political reality. Number three, could a faction capture that convention? Maybe so, but so what? It is an event for proposing amendments which three-fourths of the uh, several states need to ratify. 38 states, 13 states could block it. One house in 13 states, forgetting Nevada for a second, could block it. There are 13 solid red states on this field and 13 solid blue states. There is no plausible way in which these states don't do their role to assure no extreme blue or red amendment gets passed. So number four, how technically could we make this work? The reason this strategy is so attractive to me is that there is, I think, a political opportunity here. The political opportunity is that people of radically different views about the need for change and the kind of change that's necessary can work together to get to a place where we can talk and deliberate sensibly about the changes our Constitution needs. What a convention is, is a place where people take the question seriously and they address it in longer than 140 character responses. <laughs> it is an opportunity for serious citizenship. It is a place where that serious citizenship happens. And it is an opportunity for us, as opposed to the insiders, to have a role in that deliberation. And this diverse support people who support balanced budget, people who support line item veto, people who support changing the fundamental way in which money corrupts the system. Diverse support can get us to this place. And even if we don't get to the place, even if we don't get the 34 states necessary to call for a convention, as history has taught us again and again, there is enormous pressure on the institution of the insiders the closer we get. Every state that joins this call for a convention terrifies Washington. And the closer we get to a convention, the closer Washington gets to finally fixing whatever it is that's motivating a diverse range of people from calling a convention. So here's one structure that I think achieves what sounds to me like a common objective. Imagine this as a resolution coming from the state of Utah. State of Utah speaking through its legislature pursuant to Article 5 of the Constitution hereby petitions the United States Congress to call a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. That Clause 1 is a full, simple call for a convention, completely unambiguous for purposes of Article 5. Then Clause 2. Furthermore, Utah would propose that the convention consider amendments to strengthen the veto power of the president for, by example, among other possible solutions, giving him a line item veto authority. That's an expression of their preference. Number three, Utah requests that its proposal notwithstanding, Congress restrict the agenda of the convention to considering only those matters enumerated by at least 40% of the states calling for a convention. So you say, here's what we care about but we also care to be in a convention where only substantial issues will be considered. So we say, restrict it to those things that have 40%. And here's the part that's most important to me. Utah requests that Congress exclude from eligibility as delegates to the convention any current member of Congress. I would also say, yeah. You have to swear not to become a member of Congress for at least 20 years to be anything to do with this uh, uh, delegate. Okay, now, this is technically enabling no ambiguity about whether such a set of provisions enacted by 34 states would, uh, would make it impossible without revolution, in my view, to force this convention, and politically limiting, in the sense that it sets political boundaries that everybody could understand enough to say that if this convention ran away from those boundaries, there's something wrong with the convention. Now, is it still dangerous? Well, there's one part of this question, is it dangerous? which I kind of think of, is it dangerous to rely upon a process which is essentially a we the people process? And despite my pedigree at this institution, 
<laughs> I am a populist about this question. I say, you question we the people, I say WTF in response to you. <laughs> WTF in response to you. You can secretly in your head say this whole idea of a democracy or a representative democracy is just bunk, like a republic should be run by technocrats. I say move to China if you believe that. <laughs> I think we need to fight hard to restore the idea of how a republic would be responsive through a democratic process. And whether that includes altering the Senate or whatever, I'm happy to have that conversation, but I'm not gonna give up the fundamental commitment to a democracy whose sovereignty sits with the people. But is it dangerous in a different sense? I think it is dangerous in a different sense, absolutely dangerous in a different sense, to their monopoly, to this cancer that has destroyed this government. This is the one mechanism that they can't yet control or the control has not yet been perfected. I don't think they, I'm not saying they can't exercise influence, I'm not saying they won't try, but they don't have the well-tuned machine that lives within the Beltway right now. And it is terrifying to them and should not be terrifying to the sovereign, namely to us. Okay, that's the argument, but here's the reality. We're never gonna convince people with an argument. However long, however persuasive we can construct this argument, argument won't cut it. It's not enough. We need to show, not tell. We need to show people why this makes sense. Don't tell them it makes sense. We need to convince America by showing America in convention after convention that we the people actually make some sense, that amateur politics is better than professional politics, the one sport where it turns out the amateur is better than the professional, right? So imagine this, this process, right? Imagine something like a mock convention in a box process. Building on Jim Fishkin's deliberative polling process, we imagine a process where we can randomly select 300 people from some jurisdiction, randomly select and make sure it's representative of people in the jurisdiction. That's the essential way in which deliberative polls work. Bring them together, have them meet and deliberate about these questions of what amendments should be proposed to our Constitution. Now, we've actually run one of these. The Coffee Party in Louis, uh, Louisville at their convention ran one. It wasn't a pure deliberative poll. There was nothing random about it. I went to that elite law professor, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, right, okay. We're going to spend a whole day listening to people talk about what the Constitution did. Okay, I'll do it, Annabelle, I'll do it, but Jesus, this is a waste of my life. <laughs> I was astonished. I was astonished at the work of that convention. There is something, there's something like the magic of how certain juries get called into life about putting people into a room and telling them to think seriously about matters that are fundamental to their citizenship and they turn out to have something sensible to say and to think and to reason and to propose. So now imagine that we ran hundreds of these across the country over periods of time. For the next five years, the next 10, we ran these period time after time and we posted the results. And we allowed people to review these results and looked at what we, us, could do as amateurs, as people who are just randomly selected for the purpose of talking about what should happen to this Constitution. My bet is that this would be the most impressive political work of this nation. Nothing that would happen would compare in quality or inspiration to this work. And as more and more of these conventions produced this image, it would build support for the same structure in the context of a real convention. Because I'm with my teacher here, Sandy Levinson, that the way we get around all of the political public choice problems about a convention like this is we convince America that in fact, we the people could act as a public jury for the purpose of thinking about what Amendments America should consider, that's it, just consider. And randomly selecting delegates from voters, if it included some felons, excellent, because we have too many felons in this country. <laughs> it includes everybody, randomly selecting anybody, I don't care, let them make their proposals and their ideas, they produce proposals which go to ratification and are ratified only if America believes. Now, this is just one idea to beat away what I think of as the corrupting influence of this cancer. But here's the thing. 
as I've struggled to fight this problem, increasingly I think, if it's not this, then what is, what is it going to be? And when I hear Alexandra talk about the extraordinary series of problems which immigrants in the United States face, and you step back to think, well, why is it politics is skewed? And part of the reason it's skewed has to do with the worst instincts in people, but part of the reason it's skewed is that the politicians are not caring about the interests they should be caring about. They're caring about interests that are driving them and distracting them in the way that I've described. So if we're not going to adopt a strategy like this to get us out of this corruption, then what is the strategy? What is it that we have? There is no muddling through here. We don't have the time. On the left, we don't believe we have the time because of global warming or healthcare or food safety or pick your issue. On the right, we don't believe we have the time because we can't have a government that runs or taxes so inefficiently or so stupidly. We don't have the time and we won't change it until we change the core way in which the system works. I don't know, we don't know whether we can actually succeed in this. But we do know what it takes to start. And what it takes to start is a certain kind of courage, the courage to tell them to put the bottle down, the courage in us to resist the hate, to resist the business model, as Mark Meckler was describing today, the business model of this era, this business model of polarization, of political parties and media entities, the business model that says we make the most only if we find ways to separate and make everyone hate each other. It takes the courage to resist that. It takes the remembering of a different way to think about the way contest fights <laughs> could occur. <laughs> Understanding the appropriate place for battle, but also recognizing Recognizing there's a need for us to step off stage, step off stage and work together to produce the kind of democracy that could work for either side when they're lucky enough to win. Now, sometimes that happens in our political system. This was one of those moments I could not believe. I believe. You are a scriptural man. I've read Leviticus. But you know why? <laughs> Let me ask you yeah. this. No, uh, no, do we have the, to the corruption, you're absolutely right. It is, right? It, it, it's a corrupt system because these people... liberal ones just as bad as the right-wing ones. The liberal pinheads just as bad as the right-wing pinheads. Look, if it's possible for these guys to agree about the fundamental problem that is facing this nation, the corruption that comes from this structure of financing and funding our government, if it's possible, if that's possible, I think a convention is possible. And if a convention is possible, I think we have a chance to repair this divided house. Repeated today already, the story of Franklin walking out 
being carried out from the convention. As he's carried out from the convention, the woman approaches him and says, Madam, he says, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? And Franklin responds, a republic, if you can keep it. A republic, a representative democracy, democracy dependent upon the people alone. We have lost that republic. And we all together need to act in this way to get it back. Thank you very much. Thank you.